Luciano Rizzola um, uh, from uh, Frankfurt will give the, the next, that was part one. Part two will be state of the art uh, in current simulations as Luciano gets started. I'll let you go. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about the present while my colleagues have told you about the past. And the present is about the kind of things we can do thanks to the development that have been going on over uh, the past 30 years, really. So um, the title is about binary neutron stars, but if you want, the subtitle is really all about numerical relativity, which in my interpretation is the art, the subtle art of solving Einstein's equations. So for those of you who are, are you know, uh, enjoy seeing equations, these are the equations we need to solve. These are, um, you know, a set of covariant uh, tensor equations. Then on top, we have the Einstein's equations, then we have equations that are related to other dynamics or magneto other dynamics. Then you have other equations that may have to do with neutrinos and radiation. And all of these equations have f some mathematical properties that have fascinated physicists and mathematicians alike for the last 100 years. They are considered one of the most beautiful mathematical e equations that we know in physics. But their beauty disappears very quickly by the time you try and actually solve them, because those equations then have to be written in something that looks like so, where you have on the left-hand side a time derivative of whatever, tensors, and on the right-hand side you have a complicated setup which involves f up to second order partial derivatives. And um, one of the system that we saw that was mentioned actually in the previous talk, the CCZ4, has 58 of these variables that need to be evolved at every time step. Um, and of course, you need supercomputers to do this. And this is why progress in this area has, has been so tightly connected with progress in HPC. Without HPC, we would have just been left with beautiful equations without solutions. But now we have solutions, and uh, one of these solutions, of course, is in, in the case of binary black holes. So this is the same slide that Ed has shown. This is the first time something was seen, 2015. 2005, 10 years earlier, we had already computed that waveform theoretically. And um, this is an example of what you need to do to solve that problem. So in vacuum, black holes are in vacuum, there is no matter. Uh, the Einstein's equation re it reduced to this, r mu nu equal to zero. That looks like a very simple algebraic equation. That's not. It's really still a second order, highly nonlinear differential equation. And the way you solve this is by setting up a, a complex grid structure which has mesh refinement there, and so high resolution there where the space time is particularly curved, highly curved. And you can see this is shown in this animation over here. Uh, these are two black holes which have the same mass but have different spin. The spin is in the vertical direction. You can see how rapidly um, curvature changes near the black hole, and that's why you need very high resolution. You start with some initial data, and then the solution on those equations provides you with the dynamics, with the equations of motion and the emission gravitational waves. This is all contained in those equations. At this point, you can see that a black hole is actually produced. A single horizon is produced, but this will very rapidly s settle down to an axisymmetric curve or rotating black hole, and this is the last signal that is produced by the system. And uh, this wave field is what we actually see at large distance in our detectors. And um, you know, this is the beauty of, of, of doing this type of work is that you can actually go and, and check the, the waveform. The waveform would be essentially this, this sequence of ups and down that you have seen otherwise in, as a time series. So it would look something like so. Okay? This is something actually I have computed in 2006. Nowadays, we can do things like this. We can do community-driven, large exploration of the space of parameters where we can have very long waveforms, we can have very many different setups, but essentially it's the same physics that I was mentioning before. And um, what about neutron stars? Well, neutron stars are similar and yet different. For those of you who are not familiar with neutron stars, neutron stars are produced at the end of the life of very massive stars when they explode in the form of supernovae. These are really marvels of nature. And just to have an idea, one single neutron star has more mass than the entire solar system, and yet has a size of about 10 kilometers. So imagine something which is as big as Hamburg, but has more mass than the whole solar system. They are so complex that where all the physics we know goes astray. And um, you can consider them as Einstein's richest laboratory. 
when you have two neutron stars that merge, you don't produce immediately a black hole. When you two have two black holes, they merge and immediately produce a black hole. In the case of neutron star, you produce something else, which is called an hypermass neutron star. This is an object which is not in equilibrium, which will then collapse to a black hole. There's going to be some matter around it which will not fall onto the black hole, but eventually, and then you produce, uh, at the end, a black hole in vacuum. And if we understand this part over here, we, understand, we have a way of understanding how what, what is the internal structure of neutron stars, which, which we ignore yet. Um, if we understand what happens during this stage, we understand how light can be produced as a result of this uh, process. These are called gamma ray bursts, and these are very, very powerful explosions that we see uh, in astrophysics. And, and part of the matter that is not going to the black hole is actually reaching infinity, and that's very neutron-rich matter, we say, and as a result, we produce heavy nucleosynthesis, heavy elements of nucleosynthesis, and gold. All the gold that you have now with you is a result of the merger of neutron stars. Just imagine that. Okay, so what does a, a neutron star collision look like? That, that's what it will look like. This is, again, a simulation of the set of uh, equations I've illustrated before. The two stars get closer to each other. As they get close, they, they tend to deform because of the tidal field, and uh, they will collide um, almost rubbing e e each other. This is the density, by the way. And as you can see, you have an object which is not a black hole yet. This is on, on time scales of milliseconds. And then as the object is losing angular momentum through gravitational waves, it will collapse at one point, produce what is called an apparent horizon. And, and what you can see outside, this is uh, what we call the torus, okay? So this is not computer graphics, this is really the, set, the, the solution of the equations that we illustrated before. The, the geometry and the microphysics is very important. Just to give you an idea of what happens if you take the same system, but now you change the ratio in the masses. They are not equal masses. In this case, this little guy is the more massive one, is more compact. And because it has more mass, it will strip mass away from the companion and will accrete a lot of mass, collapsing to a black hole, producing this very large explosion of, of matter. And some of this matter is the one that is lost and then will produce gold uh, later on. And um, you can, you know, through the use of HPC, you, you can do these simulations and you can analyze all the aspects of this, of this, uh, of this phenomenon. You can understand what are the properties and how this object, this, this system where you have a black hole and this uh, accretion of matter around it can produce then a gamma ray burst. This is the kind of things we actually can do nowadays, you know, many different waveforms with different equations of state. Different equations of state are different colors, different columns are different masses of the system. And so you, because we don't know what is the equation of state, we have to model all of these possibilities. And so you have what we call soft equations of state or stiff equations of state. And to produce this colorful plot, um, we have used about one year of computing time on SuperMOOC in Munich. Uh, just to give you an idea how expensive these calculations are. And, um, and of course, I will not go into the details of the physics that you can learn, but you, you can understand that they are all different. And so we can easily correlate the properties of the gravitational wave signal with the properties of the neutron stars. And you know, we haven't seen any of this yet. All of what we've seen is before the two stars merge, but we haven't seen the post-merger yet. Now, uh, I was asked to say something also about um, black holes and images. And pretty much most of the equations I've shown you can be used also in a completely different context, and that is accretion onto supermassive black holes. So these are very big black holes at the center of galaxies and for instance, like at the center of our galaxy. And this is something that I'm also been involved as a part of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration that in 2019 has published this image, okay? That's an image that colleagues of mine have produced using the, the data we have collected. And my task was, how do you explain this? Why does it look like that? And that's what I'll try to explain to you. So in essence, there are three basic steps in order to understand what's going on. The first one is what we call 
general relativistic magneto hydrodynamics simulations in arbitrary space times. The second one is ray traced radiative transfer images. And the last one is the comparison with the observations. To be a bit more uh, transparent, what I mean with the first step is that we want to understand what happens to matter when it gets close to a black hole and is about to accrete, how it will start becoming, changing its properties, in particular becoming hot and radiate. The second part is once you have this plasma that is hot and radiating, how does light behave near a black hole? This is a very different uh, you know, way of behaving than what we used to say here in this room. And the third one is, well, we don't know much about the conditions near a black hole, uh, so we have to explore a very large space of parameters, reproducing all possibilities and then finding the right match. So this is an example of the first step. The, uh, uh, this is a, a torus of matter which is accreting as a result of a magnetohydrodynamic instability. Uh, shown in red and yellow is the density, and shown in white, blue is instead the magnetization, the strength of the magnetic field. And what you can see very e easily is that magnetic field is co collimated and very close to the polar axis, while matter remains mostly on the equatorial axis. This is a rotating black hole. Something else you can also appreciate is that accretion is not a steady process. It's a chaotic, turbulent motion, and, and as a result, the accretion will up, up, happen at rates which are fluctuating. Just like when you are next to a waterfall, you would see that the overall amount of data, uh, water that comes um, changes, but is steady overall. This is the inclination at which we think we are observing M87, uh, the first black hole we observed. And now imagine to wear glasses that allow you to see synchrotron emission, so radio emission. That's what your eyes would see, would see a ring of light, almost uniform, fluctuating and going around as a result of rotation. This is a bit misleading because we are in a very special inclination. But if you go around this very same image, then you would see that the image looks very funny. Um, still, in theoretical prediction, this is a synthetic image of what a telescope, or what our set of telescope, would see of that image. Okay? It's not a perfect resolution, and that's why that image would be converted into something else, and this is what we observe. So you can already appreciate that we have a pretty good understanding of why you have an object which has a bright ring and uh, why there should be a dark spot at the center. This is just a, 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 a further rendering to see how large our simulation is. So tracing photons near a black hole is less trivial than you may think. Everybody knows how to use a laser pointer. That's because we are used to light propagation in a flat space time. I know I press a button, a green dot appears there. But if I were in a curved space time, I would need to calculate exactly what is the trajectory that uh, photons do. To make this with an example, suppose that you have a black hole, you have a ring of matter which is emitting light, it's a very thin layer of matter emitting light, and you want to take a photo at a given inclination. Well, you would first get all the photons that come right from the part of the disk which is directly pointing towards the observer. So just like you see the front of my body, that's because you're getting all the photons that are emitted from my front part of the, of, of the, of, of the body. But you will also see photons that would be otherwise not visible because they would be directed vertically and that are bent because of the bending, bending of the space-time and so you would see something just like that. And to make things even more interesting, you would see also the lower part, the photons that are coming from the lower sheet of the accretion disk. Um, I don't know if you recognize this image. This comes from Interstellar, the movie. Now you understand why the, 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 the image looks like that. This is a part of the disk as the, the astronauts are going towards this supermassive black hole. This is a part of the disk behind the black hole that you wouldn't expect to see, and this is a part of the disk below. And while this is not quite the right image and has some flaws, it tells you a very important lesson. If you have to hide, don't go behind a black hole. It will not help you. So, um, as I said, we have no idea what are the physical conditions. We have rather vague ideas of what are the physical conditions. So we had to produce um, a number of high-resolution images, 
simulations. Out of this, we had to produce some physical scenario where we would change the property of the mission. Just to give you an idea, this is a part of this library that we have produced in order to then build a library of images. And you can see there are very different situations where the, 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 the object has a very large image, a very large shadow or a very small shadow. The, 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 the flow is rotating or counter-rotating with respect to the black hole and so on. And uh, in this way, we built about 60,000 images. And of course, we had to then find, so these are all perfectly physically and mathematically consistent. Given the assumptions, they reproduce exactly what physics would tell you. But out of the 60,000, only few would match what we had observed. And so there was this additional step that was needed in order to select the right ones. And uh, uh, so just to give you an idea, this is an example of this, uh, of this um, comparison. This is the observations, and this is the theoretical model. And you can see that the match is very, very good. You can because we know everything about this model, we have built, we, we have a complete knowledge. You may think, OK, then you have a complete knowledge also of this model. Unfortunately, it's not like that. And that's because there are many images with different properties that match equally well the images. So these are called the degeneracies. These are inevitable in astrophysics. In our specific case, this is both good and bad. It's good because all of the degeneracies are telling us that this is a black hole. None of the other object that fits the data is a black hole. The only ones that fit the data are black holes. On the other hand, it's bad because we are blind. We are blind to some of the properties of this black hole. In particular, we are blind to the spin because black holes with different spins but different physical, microphysical properties would give exactly the same match or a, a comparable match with the data. OK, so I would like to come to my conclusions. Um, so over the last 50 years, and this is something that Ed has remarked, starting with very idealized setup, but um, we have made very large and huge progress in modeling both black holes and neutron stars. And uh, the reason why this is possible is because you know, both very advanced mathematical methods have been employed and numerical techniques. But even employing such techniques without having access to community efforts like the Einstein toolkit or HPC communities and facilities, all of our uh, you know, dreams would have remained so and we wouldn't have obtained the progress and understanding that we have nowadays. So my, uh, my view is that the future in this area of research is extremely bright for a number of reasons. We will get more data, both from gravitational waves and from uh, imaging of black holes. But the progress inevitably will depend on the resources, the computational resources that we have, and uh, inevitably, as w was mentioned this morning, the ability of making best use of these resources using novel methods. And if you're interested about knowing more about gravity, this is a book that just uh, was out last month. Uh, uh, it's called The Irresistible Attraction of Gravity, and tells you a little bit about all of what I presented here. That's my last slide, and I will now leave the word to my colleague. Well, you are sehr punktlich. <laughs> Thank you, Luciano. That was great. And who yeah. was the author of that book?